I mean, the first speaker is Ayal. Here, here. Let's first be very clear what this debate is about. This is not a debate between being a billionaire and retiring at the age of 30, and in between starving to death or being like a starving artist that can't provide for, for his rent. We are talking about, for example, an academic person who is a teacher, someone who has significantly less money than a person who works in high tech, works as a lawyer, and so on. So there are things you will not be able to afford, like you might not be able to buy your own place, you'll have to rent, you might not be able to live in the place you most want to, you might have to give up some vacations abroad. These are the sort of trade-offs that we're talking about. On the other hand, we're going to be charitable and grant to the other side that you're, it's not like you're going to hate your, your high-paying job, but you are not going to be super thrilled coming to work in the morning, whereas in our chance, you do feel like this is something that fulfills you, this is what you were meant to do. Not every day is perfect, but generally speaking, you have significantly more satisfaction with your work. So this is basically a comparison between the ability to be satisfied with what you're doing and the ability to have more stuff and have more economic, more economic welfare individually. Three comparatives then between these two things. First of all, the centrality of both to your life. Second of all, the impact on social circles. And three, the ability for regret if you do not like what you are doing. So, centrality to life. Money is not a major part of my identity. The reason for that is the same money, if, for example, I got $500,000 now, that would not change what sort of person I am. That, that money can move to someone else. The, the effect, identity effect this has on me is significantly less great than what, defining myself by what I do, by what I stand up every day and going to work and uh, spending the great majority of my time doing, having a unique effect on the world that I have in this job knowing I am doing something no other person could have done in exactly the same way. So, secondly, the amount of time that I put into this, the amount of time that I have to use that additional money is relatively small. We spend most of our work, most of our waking hours at work. And especially in a high pressure work like the sort that the opposition side is defending, we mostly have sometimes weekends and we have the ability, maybe sometime in the future, where I go to pension when I'm 65 years old and my ability to enjoy that significantly less. However, going to work is something I do every day. That the ability, if I'm satisfied with that work, if I feel that it gives me purpose, that is significantly more of my life in which I feel accomplished. Finally, we say that even if we grant them that I am able to have many of the great choices that they, uh, that they want to talk about, with money gives me more choice, gives me more ability to influence my life, we are not sure that choice is always good for your happiness. Because the more things I choose from, the more things I end up giving up. That means that I feel that I significantly more regret. I feel much more paralysis when I feel I could have done all these other things and I'm rejecting each and every one of them. People are less effective in making choices, less like happy with their choices when they have more of them. So, uh, so in all that sense, as we say, that it's much more central to my happiness to have a job that I love rather than having lots of money. Second of all, let's talk about social circles. Most of our friends, other people we work with, uh, this is other people we connect with, again, especially if we have a high-pressure job, one that takes up a lot of our time. In a high-pay grade environment, people are, ne by, ne by necessity, competing with each other for the higher positions, for, the, uh, for getting the next promotion. What that means is, every person I'm working with, my whole friend circle, are people to, who have a <coughs> vested interest waiting for me to fail at what I'm doing. That is a terrible environment to live my life in. We are saying that when people are jointly committed to work towards a certain goal, like promoting human knowledge, such as charity, all these things, they are much less likely to be in this way. Moreover, I know that all these people have also given up working for higher profit. That means they are less selfish. That means they are people I'm more likely to be able to trust. I'll take a few right now. The reality of this debate is not about having time to go to Paris, it's about not having to dread being able to pay off your debt at the end of the month, which you cannot guarantee given your own characterization. Thank you. So, first of all, we don't think that student de that having huge debts is a likely scenario in most of the world when, okay. uh, where this debate takes place. Shams is going to extend on that further. F uh, finally, in terms of social circles, we say that the ability to have a family, to spend time with your family, to actually have, uh, to have the time for them is much, much greater in our world than in theirs, and that is another major source of people's happiness. Finally, the ability to regret. On our side, 
if you regret, if you feel that you have done, that this choice wasn't right, although we've given you great reasons why it would be right, it's much easier to move to the sort of job they are talking about. Why? Simply because at the point where you uh, where you make lots of money, you become used to that money. You pay, you get mortgages, you take things that the, you get used to a certain level of expenditure. If you go back to a job that pays significantly less, you go bankrupt. That's when you're dealing with crypto debt. On our side, if you feel that this job is not fulfilling to you, it's much easier to move to a higher paying job. You have unique skills that no one else in this industry has. For these reasons, we are very proud to propose the motion. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I would like to thank Ayal on his speech, and as the leader of the opposition, please welcome Tin Pulic. Here, here. For such a world famous debater, the lack of comparative on Ayal's side is seriously astonishing. <laughs> the only world in which this case can be true is a world in which the way we imagine our passions turns out to be the way they play out. Ayala is right to say that people are not super thrilled when they go to work on their side. Also true on our side, true for all sides in this debate. Why? Because at the end of the day, when you're a super young person, you are passionate about something and you want to change the world, you do not get to realize all the ways in which you will not be able to change the world. So let's analyze comparatives. We do not think that this is going to be a, a job where you feel that you're changing the world every day. It's more likely going to be full of bureaucratic bullshit. It's more likely going to be full of people you dislike on both sides. On their side there is competitiveness, but on our side there's still people who are going to talk behind your back. There's still going to be people who are not, if you're a teacher for example, going to want to adapt to your educational methods. There are people who are going to want to push you out of your job for ideological reasons. There are people you like and people you dislike on both sides of the house. However, on your side, exactly because you are passionate, you're more likely to be frustrated by the slow progression that you have to face. For example, if you're in academia and you want to change the system and you find that the system is inert, when you find that your job is the same run-of-the-mill routine every single day, that nobody appreciates you and nobody has time to listen to your ideas. At the point where you start realizing that what you are doing is not world changing, you are likely to start being disappointed. Because what you have imagined your life is going to be is not what your life turns out. At that point, it also becomes a problem that it pays less. Because what then happens within your head? Two things. A, you're probably likely to internalize the idea that you made a wrong choice, that your passion was not something you were meant to do, and that you essentially screwed yourself over. Secondly, you're also more likely to feel guilt because of the fact that you're less able to provide, for example, for your family. More about that later. Now let's talk about the comparative on money, which you want to talk about. We're perfectly happy to accept their framing this from an upper middle class person. But there are some things which they cannot outframe in this debate. Ayal tries to downplay this, but it's not, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna run past us here. You still do have things such as mortgages you have to pay off. Even in the modern civilized world, Ayala talks about you have student debt which is transgenerationally transmitted. You have unexpected healthcare costs which you may have to face. You have pensions you have to take care about. Your kids may want to have to go to college. What does that mean at the end of the day? That means that every single day you are dreading what might happen and not being able to pay for something. So to the extent to which Ayala wants to talk about happiness, which you're probably less likely to be happy at the point that A, you believe your passion has failed you because it has not turned out the passion you wanted to be, at the point where you know that there may come a situation in life where you cannot provide for that life, but even worse, if you want to talk about social circles and that magic and that comparative, where you <clears throat> maybe have more time to spend with your family, but you also have deep existential guilt because of the fact that you feel that you have made the wrong choice for them. Instead of doing something that could have provided for that family, at this point, you keep on doing something which you love, which you know was probably a rational decision, because you knew you had an offer for a job that would pay more. You knew you had an offer for a job that would probably lend you the money to take your kids to college, to this and other, whatever they wanted. Now you cannot do this, and you feel guilty, because your family is suffering due to your actions. That guilt at the end of the day prevents you from being happy. So to the extent to which their everyday jobs will have problems and probably have less happy days than I don't know, just routine days or boring days, the feeling you do have when you come home, regardless of how much time that is, is incredibly important. So we do not think this debate is about time and choice, so much so as it's about enabling you to live a life 
without having fear hanging over your head every day. But we're going to grant them their best case comparative. Before I do that, I'm going to take the other hand. So Milos, when he sings in a, band, in a metal band, he doesn't think he's going to change the world. He just thinks this is something he really enjoys doing much more than working a corporate job. Yes, but Milos still has a corporate job apart from singing in a metal band because the only way Milos can enjoy singing in a metal band is knowing that he will not have a crippling debt to pay off in five years and then regret having to sing in the first place. But even if we grant you your best case comparative, and that is the idea that this debate is about time, we say even if it boils down to your later life and your later years after you retire, we say it's probably better for you to have savings which you can use to pursue the interests you have in your own way without being troubled by the rules, by the circle dripping of academia or whatever else. Simply realize what you want to do and do it in the way you want to, to be happy, to provide for the people you love, for your family and for your friends and to find a source of fulfillment in that at the end of the day. Given that in their best case scenario, even if this person is a young person, a talented person, an upper middle class person who may even get promoted, they cannot guarantee that this person will be able to escape the fear and the actual practical possibility of their lives being ruined, whereas simultaneously they cannot guarantee far more joy than we can. The fact that on our side we give you more capabilities for people to make choices and to do things for their lives, it is very clear that opposition ought to take the I would like to thank Tin on a fine, uh, fine speech, and as DPM now we have Sharmila, so give it a go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's well documented that people on their deathbed tend to regret two things. One, not having spent more time with their families, and two, giving up on the things they love. When someone is diagnosed with a terminal illness, and they realize quite clearly that their time on earth is limited, what's the usual first thing they do? Quit the boring job. Quit the job that has been a source of stress. Spend more time with family. Pass on your knowledge. Mentor people. Secure your legacy. Do the things you love in your final days. This clarity of perspective that they have about the things that matter is the clarity of perspective we are saying we should have when we are 21. There are two points of rebuttal I want to talk about before I directly clash with the idea of existential anguish and purpose and why we win that on our side, actually. So let's talk about unrealistic <coughs> expectations of jobs. So, it is correct. Yeah. Um, you end up hating more people than you would have wanted in either world. People suck. Next, you end up navigating bureaucracy and hierarchies in your jobs in either world. Because if we can assume that you're someone who will rise to the top in your bureaucracy, in the legal world or the business world, then, then you can assume that for academia and charities as well. They are also meritocratic institutions, in fact, probably more meritocratic. So it's true, like in both situations, there's some false advertising about the kind of work you do. In academia, you think you will be like doing research all the time, half the time you're writing grant proposals. The same is true of the legal world. You're not like in Boston legal arguing cases like a genius all the time. Half the time is pouring over like taxation law and things like that. So in both worlds, there's boredom. They say they win out because there's money on their side. We say we win out because you have far more control over your time on our side. The long hours and the stress and the anguish of doing something that is for the benefit of someone else is actually weighed out by our side. More on that when I discuss purpose and existential anguish. So they can't run away from the fact that in their world, even if you are able to provide materially for your kids a bit better, so they go to a posh private school, you see them, what, once a week. You're unable to make it to the important events in their lives. You're not emotionally present for them. And this experience of parenthood is quite empty and hollow, to be honest. They talk about, like, second point, the, the lack of mental security because of crippling debt on our side. So the first answer here is, you know, a middle class or a lower middle class lifestyle is actually not difficult to sustain in most parts of the world for average reasonable college graduates who are reasonably competent. Like if you were someone who was actually qualified enough to make it to these high flying industries, then you would also be very good at these other industries we're talking about. So if you're good enough to be quote unquote like in given a job offer to a fancy pants law firm, you would probably be very good in academia as well. You would probably be very good in like putting up this art academy as well and all these other things that so you'd be reasonably competent in this work, right? Now, if you need a side thing because you want a cushion, you can do that, exactly what Milos is doing. 
But the primary direction of your life should be doing what you love and not committing yourself to making more money for other people. Yes, your point. The reason why people regret not having done the things they love is because not having done them, they do not know how it would have turned out. When they see that how it turns out is not exactly what their passion was, the regret is not comparative. Then the debate becomes about where you fulfill more obligations towards other people and where you have more choice. Yeah, yeah, but this assumes it turns out exactly the way they want and in a way that makes them happy in your world. A lot of times, people desire money because it is founded on a promise. A, a belief that this money will lead to other things later on, like a, a more fun retirement, more fun with your kids. But that also turns out to be empty and hollow later on. So this needs to be comparative, right? And we've given you structural reasons for why you're more likely to have those regrets in the case of money. Now let's talk about existential guilt and a sense of purpose. So in this capitalist world we have, right, most financial values assigned to work that has an immediate result, a short-term measurable result, like profit for your company or a legal victory in a court case. Work that involves investing in human rights, in building civil society, in promoting the environment, the results are less visible, less measurable, less easy. But this is valuable and fulfilling work, right? Now, if Tim tells you that a, per a person could experience existential guilt by not giving their family enough of a good life, you are also likely to experience that ex existential guilt by not doing your share to the greater community by not contributing to it. And even worse, actually, you experience an existential guilt by, by maybe potentially being a negative liability to the earth because you participate in occupations that do make things worse. And in fact, the occupations we you know, suggest and celebrate on our side offset the harms caused by these people. Like, why is the source of existential guilt simply not being able to provide for your family? Like, if the impetus for that exists, then it is more likely that at your deathbed you're like, I was an evil banker slash war criminal. I wish I had just worked with human rights. Instead, we are proud of the people. I would like to thank Sharmila on her speech and as the second speaker on the opposition bench, here comes Milos. Here, here. Finding out tweets 
what you did when you were little, this, this old, because this is the only way for them to put you down when money is not a comparative. Notice that in these, th these things hurt way more when you care about what other people think and perception that you are a moral person and you chose well, because you have this looming threat of, oh, I could have been rich uh, and not, not, and not tolerate this or this sort of situation. Uh, and notice that last point that he said, you can always go to your higher paying job, but you cannot when you have a crippling debt. Notice that you also still need a CV, you still need a, a lot of, how do you say, experience if you want to transition there. But notice that if I have, like, both sides have debt, <coughs> but I usually corporate sellouts have more money than they can ever spend, so they usually invest it, do other stuff like that. So we say it's uh, literally more plausible for you to switch to a lower paying job, even though we don't want to make this debate more confusing by that comparison. Look, look, doing things that you love makes you hate the things that you love in the first place. First of all, you're 20, you're 20 something. You have a completely different opinion of what do you think you will love or not. First of all, plagued by movies and popular culture that is bashing Wolf of Wall Street and that lies on how horrible it is, even though it's amazing. No, uh, but like the pop culture telling you that sacrifice is amazing, the sacrifice is great. Uh, also, you focus on most of the fun things because these things, people in movies, these people they tell you about, they're like people who do actually have fun, but you do not focus on the minority of people who are actually in a horrible situation. But also you are an idealistic person at that time, which means that you idealize the way that the things will work. So notice that with this high expectation, whatever happens that you do in your work, it will be a disappointment from your beliefs of what it will look like. But notice in the comparative, you don't, you hate this job. And as I said, you, you are dispassionate about it. But notice, you think there will be nothing interesting there. But notice that objectively, there will be some things that you will be interested in there, because there will be intellectual challenges, you will be research and stuff like that. Notice that you can only be surprised and pleasantly surprised by the thing that you didn't think you will like, but you can only be disappointed by these things in, on their side. But notice that it's very horrible to be disappointed in your dreams in this situation. You can always have this rationalization, if I followed my dream, that would have been good. But it's, if, you, if you let it down, you, you feel even worse about your choices. Because there is bureaucracy to work with, because there's horrible old people that don't want to change their ways in academia and stuff like that. Notice one more point that Lucia can then sum up in this sort of situation. You are detached from the consequences of your job when you're a banker rather than when you're a teacher. Notice that if you're a kind of person that very much likes to help people like Ayal presented in this sort of situation, it's very important that you can feel some tangible impact. Notice how harder it is when you value your self-worth and stuff like that by the impact that your job is having in this sort of situation. Especially if we told you that this is not sunshine and rainbows, that there will be kids failing, there will be kids in front of you who have having equality problems that you will want to solve because you're this kind of person going in that direction, but you can't. So this will also plague you on top of you not having money like Tim like told you about. But notice, on the comparative, you are pretty much detached. You don't, you're working with fucking numbers, you're working with high corporate cases, and you can convince yourself that it's less important than unimportant in this sort of situation. So you will end up hating the thing that you, that you like, you will end up feeling powerless in the world where you cannot change the world by being a teacher and stuff like that, and this will overall leave you in misery. Uh, that's why you should definitely vote for Milos in opening the <laughs> I would like to thank Milos on his fine speech and as the last speaker on the government side, here comes Sprem. Here, here. That's something they have to defend in this debate. And what happens as a consequence of this, and this is a natural mechanism that people do, is that you substitute things for things that are, that are scarce for you. So on our side of the house, you have more time, and you can spend this time on things that give you happiness, but you need to invest a lot more time. On their side of the house, 
they need to spend their capital, which is money, on things they give them happiness. And this is where the comparative that we've been talking about is happening. So you cannot cook anymore if it brings you happiness, but you, get, you need to get delivery. You cannot walk to a place if it gives you happiness, but you have to like uh, take an over and stuff like that. You cannot make something for a person you love and give them a present, but you have to buy something expensive because you don't have time and stuff like this. You cannot take more coffee with your friends, but you have to do pre drinks for 45 minutes. This is important because it takes away a huge portion of their case. And why is that? Because simply because you don't have time and you want to feel happiness, this means you have to spend more time. So their best case scenario, which is people who want to save money for five years and then like move on and stuff like this, are people who, for, for a couple of reasons, this being the first one, live on the high value of like they spend a lot of money in status quo. The second is that you have to do this because you are surrounded by these people. You can't show up in your job and have like a $50, you know, like a shirt if all the other people have $500 shirts or something like this. You necessarily, even if it's your best interest to save money, you have to spend way, way, way much more money than you you need to have on our sale of house. So stuff about debt, stuff about like ooh, we get huge amounts of money after we quit our job are not comparative to the extent they want to claim in this debate. But let's talk about things that we get on our side of the house and why on our side of the house you get more fulfillment. So they like to talk about stuff like, oh, if you're teaching, you get lots of failure and stuff like this and stuff like this. But this is inherently more rewarding for you because you are passionate about this. And people are not surreal. They, they do not expect they are going to change the world if they go to teaching. They, they expect that they are going to be passionate about changing kids. On our side of the house, one thing, if we take teaching as an example, one thing is sure that they have to uh, deal with this in the next speech. You get to see the progress of your work on changing people directly because you work with them. When you look at the computer and you do a lot of stuff and stuff like this, you don't even know who you're doing this for. You don't know who's going to be harmed by this or not. So the passion that you get is the fulfillment that you're helping someone do something, you're helping someone else grow. That's something that they never can get on their side of the house. We think that's more important for people. And the idea that you rationalize stuff like this and blah, 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 recognize. You had friends before, you had colleagues before, they were in the 99% of the society. Now you're moving into the 1% of the society. You either constantly compare yourself to the stuff that the 99% of the society you were hanging out before you went to this corporate job are doing now and you're, you're doing in your office having expensive things and stuff like this, which is really, really bad because you cannot keep track of their schedules, you cannot hang out with them and stuff like this. You constantly compare yourself to them. Or, and they could do this option as well, you compare yourself with the rich people, right? If you compare yourself with the rich people, then you have to be as rich as the rich people because this is, this is one of the reasons why these people are a separate group of people, blah, blah, blah. So a huge portion of their case is gone if we take this property. But what are the stuff that you can have on our side, you cannot have on their side of the house? First of all, it's more likely that you can choose to have children at the point where you are ready to do so and want to do so. Why? Because you're going to be able to have time to date in the status quo. Recognize that a lot of people who work in these like 9 to 9 jobs and stuff this are too tired to even interact with other people. People in their business environment... Yeah. You do not want this debate to give us a list of things you are barred from doing because there's an equally large list on our side. The comparative is to the extent to which you can do things, where are you able to enjoy them without being disappointed in your dreams and yourself as a person? That's what you have to answer for what's from it today. Uh, but that's the point. If our list is bigger, then you guys lose, right? So this is But what, here's the important thing. Children, one of the most fulfilling things, like people are doing this like, since we became people. All right, <laughs> and you, can, you simply can't have this. Uh, like the, the experience you get from having children is something that's unique on our side of the house. For two things. First of all, because you can choose to have kids. Oftentimes, you you, you know hook up with a colleague and you're working stuff like this. This is very unlikely in a very stressful environment where people are so focused on work they cannot like even have lunch breaks because they have to eat in their office stuff like this. But secondly, the relationship you have with your kids and stuff like this is something that uniquely you get in our sale house. This is when Shamila talks about like the idea of you you're just gonna send your kids to boarding school and not see them for four years because you can afford the best education and you're not gonna spend a single like birthday with your kids and stuff like this. On our side house, you get the luxury to do this. You get the luxury to transition back into the to transition back into the into the high paying job. We, and also, like you earn more money through time on our side of the house in Canada. So you get more money over time, even though you chose a professional job. We can have all things. I would like to thank Laura for his speech and as the last speaker of this debate. Here comes Lucia. Here, here, Lucia. <laughs>
something that is more sad than seeing your dreams fail in front of you. We say that that is what happens when you vote for the proposition. But importantly, we tell you that loving your job is not the only thing that is integral to a person. That having the ability to have other passions, to interact with your kids knowing that you gave them the life that they deserve, rather than the life that you gave them just because you were selfish and chose something for you rather than for them, is something that we prefer in this debate. Two questions for you. I am first going to ask, is love for your job enough? Because we don't think that the proposition in today's debate has answered or responded to any of the attacks that we gave. Secondly, I'm going to ask, how do you build, best build a life for yourself? Because we don't think that this is about people who are in their deathbeds, choosing what to do with the last weeks that they have on earth. It's about people who are choosing what to best do for the whole of their future. We say that's best built when you have money. Is love enough? I think that there's two things that the proposition have said in today's debate. Firstly, they give you a very poorly analyzed argument that basically just went, oh, you love your job, therefore you're going to love everything that you do all day, every day. I think that there was generally very little response to the criticisms that we gave about how the fact is that regardless of the job that you do, you're going to deal with a lot of bullshit bureaucracy. That the fact is that you're not going to feel good about yourself when you think that you're helping children and the reality is that they're still not learning maths and you're not contributing or necessarily adding anything to them. That when the expectation is set this high up, there is nowhere to go but down. Whereas choosing a job where you already feel very negatively about it, there's nowhere to go but up, right? Everything that happens, that's good, will surprise you. The second thing that they tell you is that, oh, but you contribute to the world and that makes you feel good. I think that it's honestly quite naive to say that a teacher individually contributes more to the world than a banker that prevents world economies from collapsing. I think that you're able to, in some way, shape or form, justify to yourself, right? But also, more importantly, I think that it's really disappointing when you're a scientist and you think that you're gonna get the next big drug that's gonna cure cancer and the reality is that you're an ant in a bunch of rocks and that you're never gonna be able to change that. That you're gonna pipette things for 2,000 hours and you're still not gonna achieve anything. Seeing your dreams break in front of you is the most heartbreaking thing that can happen to a person. That's what happens when it goes on your side. No thank you. The last thing is, we also think that your dreams are sometimes better left as hobbies because then you don't have to deal with the bureaucracy. I enjoy literature and the reason I enjoy it is because I don't have to study English and read about books that I don't like. Milos loves singing because he doesn't have to go on like huge tours where he has to struggle with money and can't feed himself. We love it because it's something that brings light into our life, but we have other sources yeah. of enjoyment as well. We don't think that job, that love is enough. Yes. But your premise here is people who are following their passion have such unrealistic metrics of what they can achieve. Their metrics are, I want to make a small difference, what, and they realize that. I don't think that's true, because when you're passionate about something, you probably have spent a very long time daydreaming about it, thinking about what it's going to look like. You don't feel passionate about something because you think that you're going to be really, really bad at it. You're going to do a very, very poor job. As you yourself told us, Sharmila, you believe that you're contributing and making a difference. Yes. But we don't think that most of those are realistic. The second point, how do you best build a life for yourself? The problem is that there are many issues that even if you're able to live a very low, quiet, middle class life, you're still not going to be able to resolve. You're still going to constantly feel stressed about money, about whether you're able to make your next rent, pay your next mortgage. You're always going to feel guilty about the fact that your children have to go to a really shitty primary school rather than the kind of education that they could have got if you had just been less selfish. Sharmila tells us it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you are able to spend time with them. The reality is that your children can get that kind of enjoyment from their other family, from other friends, but you're the sole source of their means, of the money, of the future, which means that you uniquely play that role and you uniquely are going to forever feel guilty about the fact that you didn't provide them with enough things. At the end of the day, we tell you that it's not just about your job, it's about all the other aspects of your life that you actually do need money and do need power in order to be able to achieve. It's again, not about people who are in their deathbed, but about people who are choosing not just their jobs, but the ability to build a life for themselves and in the future. Even if you only have small windows of time, we say that those windows are better spent then on your passions, on your hobbies that are going to remain untainted because you can 100% dedicate them to your family, to the things that you love, rather than going to a job you love and having to spend ages on bureaucracy. Feeling your dreams broken is terrifying, but most importantly, we tell you that your better ability to build a life for yourself comes when you have money and when you have that power. Please oppose.
I would like to take all six speeches, uh, speakers on a nice speeches, and now we're heading towards the grand final. Thank you once again. Woo! Here, here.